Guten Abend, liebes Publikum. Ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich hier im E-Werk in der Galerie zur Gegenwartskunst zum heutigen Abend, der dreigeteilt ist. Zunächst werden wir einen ungefähr 20-minütigen Vortrag hören von Rama Kazam. Sie ist aus Paris zu uns angereist und wird zum Thema Zeit und Zeitlichkeit und Sichtbarkeit, also Time and Visibility und Sound und Image sprechen, da es sich um eine Begleitveranstaltung der Ausstellung Nachtstücke handelt, in der ja ähm, zwei Arbeiten sogenannte Video-Audio-Installationen sind, geht es eben heute Abend ums Thema, ums Verhältnis von Zeit, Zeitlichkeit, Sichtbarkeit, aber auch um Ton und Bild, was ja unten bei Jackie Irvine ein großes Thema ist und auch bei Theo Eschetu hinten. Und auch bei Nadia Lichtig gibt es eben nicht nur die Fotos und die Texte, sondern Nadia hat immer auch eine Soundspur, die wir heute dann im dritten Teil als ähm, wie hast du es genannt, performative Lesung äh, hören werden. Im zweiten Teil werden Rama und Nadine äh, ja, in ein kurzes Gespräch miteinander führen und dann eben im dritten Teil gibt es äh, die Performance. Kurz zu, ich möchte euch, euch beide auch ganz herzlich begrüßen, dass ihr hier seid. Ähm, kurz etwas zu Rama Kazam sagen. So a very warm welcome to you, Rama. Uh, great to have you here, and as you already know, uh, Rama um, comes originally from the UK, so she speaks English today, but she lives in Paris, so um, if you, if we have time for questions, you can also um, speak either German or French or English, so she understands all the languages, and Nadia, of course, also. So, um, I... Rama is an um, independent uh, researcher, critic, and art historian based in Paris. She has written for uh, many international magazines, such as Freeze, for example, um, on Pierre Hugues and Philippe Areno, Bareno, or also on uh, Ursula Biemann, the Swiss artist, um, and many others. Um, she has, or she studied originally philosophy and art history, and got then her um, PhD at the Sorbonne in um, theory and the aesthetic of sounds. And now you are working um, on a book on a French artist, uh, also in multimedia. So she's really the right person to talk about uh, this complex um, installation uh, using sound and images. And my personal question, of course, is how uh, do these layering of um, sound image um, also relate to memory and uh, what does this layering con contribute to um, the structure of memory um, for example in contrast to a narrative linear um, version of, of storytelling so please um, welcome Rama Kazam and thank you very much for being with us Thank you, Heidi, and also thank you, Nadia, for inviting me. And um, it's very nice to see you all here tonight. So um, my, my talk is called um, Time and Visibility, Sound and Image, Reinventing the, Sp Reinventing the Spaces of Transition. And um, I'm going to start with a question. Actually, I just want to say before I start that I've been asked to speak not too quickly, so I'm, so I'm going to try and stick to that, but if I do speak too fast, perhaps you could just make a sign and I'll, you know. So, so anyway, I'm going to start with a question, which is, wh why do we speak of the arts in the plural and not just art in the singular? Is there a kind of essence of art that transcends all the different genres? Or if, if there isn't, where, where do we situate the limits that separate the individual arts from each other. And these are actually questions that come up in a book uh, called uh, De la Différence des Arts, about the difference between the arts, by uh, Jean-Luc Serrois and Peter Sandy. But there are also questions, I think, that come up in the, um, in the exhibition that you've 
um, probably just seen uh, Nachtstücke. And um, the exhibition, I think, is for me, is really interesting because it plays with all these notions like uh, ideas like Gesamtkunstwerk, synesthetic perception, or the non-interdependence of the arts. And it kind of explores the, the layering of art forms and the frontiers between them, like each, each work has something of that. So for instance, in Jackie Irvin's work, um, If the Ground Should Open, um, it's a kind of audiovisual experience where sound and image merge. And then Nadia Lichtig's Ghost Trap, um, also downstairs and upstairs, is about translating words into photographs and texts and challenging the unities, Aristotelian unities of time and space by presenting these media in different spaces or at different times. And so in my talk, I'm going to, in the talk I'm going to give, I'm, I'm going to explore these and other examples of works that either acknowledge um, the boundaries between the arts or else that try to efface these boundaries and get rid of them. And so it's going to be, I'm going to be looking at this question as, whether, as to whether there are many arts or just one from various different angles. Um, so first of all, works that acknowledge and work with these boundaries between sound and visuals. Um, so I'm just going to start by going back to the starting point of this idea of boundaries between the arts which was, um, in fact, uh, formulated for the first time systematically by uh, Lessing, G.E. Lessing, in his um, 1766 tract, um, An Essay Upon the Limits of Poetry and Painting. And um, in this tract, Lessing tried to distinguish between um, poetry and painting by arguing that poetry consists of sounds that succeed each other in time, and painting is elements that are juxtaposed in space. And that, of course, is a distinction that um, 250 years later, you know, today, continues to be addressed. For instance, there, um, there's a, a work by um, Heimo Zogonig, Untitled, which has a white canvas where you've got, which is divided into rectangles of different sizes, and each one has the name of a color, and so this is really about this distinction where you have, um, where the viewer can read the name of the colors one by one and imagine them one after the other. And only by looking at the whole picture can you imagine all the colors next to each other. So that's really the difference between them. You have either, um, you can either sort of say, or in fact you can do it with anything. Like for instance here, in front of me I've got a computer, a microphone, a piece of paper, and um, when I say them, it takes longer, and I say them successively, and then when I look, I can see them all at the same time. So, so that's the, the difference that he's talking about. And um, so, so, uh, <coughs> um, so actually, we can see that they're quite complementary, sound and vision, as well. And um, in Ghost Trap, which is um, which you've seen. Um, there's, well, this is a three-part piece that's based on interviews with anonymous individuals, each of whom um, recounts his memory of a traumatic experience. And um, during the course of the show, the, the, the interviews are performed, at least tonight the interviews are going to be performed, whereas the photographs and texts are shown. So you see, once again, we've got the interviews which will succeed each other in time, and the photographs and texts that are juxtaposed in space. So that's the distinction. It's going to come up through everything that I, all the other examples that I'm going to give. For instance, juxtaposition and succession are also very important in the work of um, Henri Salat. So there's a film he made called Clatel Lolco Clash, 2011, where there's a group of people, each of whom is carrying a little piece of the score of a song by the rock group, The Clash. And here you see them putting the pieces of score in a barrel organ in the order of the participants' arrival. So you've got all these people queuing up. They put their score in the barrel organ. And because it's in the order of arrival, it's the, the melody is completely messed up. 
see. And during that time, the day, the light is changing, and the daylight is giving way to night time, to dark. And then suddenly, the whole thing gets reversed, so that um, the sound, um, so, so that the images suddenly become all messed up in the film, and the sound is is the one that's um, leading the way, and it's very coherent. So here it's, it's this question again of reversing the function of sound and the function of image. Um, <coughs> and so um, um, there's actually an interesting, quite an interesting quote by the artist about this, which is um, from an interview in 2011. I quote, I realized how the qualities of one medium translate into another medium and become stronger. Tempo, for example, might be felt more strongly in a series of drawings than in a musical score. For me, it was always about realizing that at the edge of one medium is the possibility of another. And this is also the case in um, another piece by Henri Salah called Mixed Media, which is, uh, sorry, Mixed Behavior, where we can see the back of a young man who's busy mixing music with his head covered because it's raining outside. And meanwhile, there's a firework display going on um, up above him in the sky. And after a few minutes, the images of the firework display are suddenly reversed in the film. And then suddenly they come back into the right order. And so it's as if the, the DJ is mixing not just the music, but also the fire display. So anyway, um, Salah is really very interested in this kind of um, co contradiction, complementarity of sound and visuals. And they also, um, the, um, these crossovers, I think, are also very interesting because they recall the phenomenon of synesthetic perception, where um, stimulation of one sensory or cognitive pathway leads to automatic involuntary experiences in a second sensory or cognitive pathway. And so, for instance, a synesthete who suffers from this illness, in fact, it is a kind of illness, might see colors in response to sound. So, for instance, uh, somebody who hears piano music might um, see an orange circle, for instance, or might feel that there's a very strong connection between the piano sounds and the color orange. And so in the examples that I've mentioned, just, just here, the information obtained through one sense is also accompanied by information obtained through another sense, so that there seems to be a strong connection between them. Over and above individual artists, there are also a lot of exhibitions, obviously, that have addressed the question of the boundaries between sound and visuals. And, um, for instance, there's an exhibition called Rift Gap Hinge, um, which took place in Vienna in 2006, and it asked, how do we show the disjunction between what is said and what is seen? And there's a work by an artist called, an Austrian artist called Heiner Stunst, which is called Fragment of a Text by Konrad Bayer, 2006, and which consists of a legible fragment of text followed by an illegible passage, um, and which is made of texts that are superimposed on each other. And so that's a kind of response to the question, because it's at the moment when you're looking at, you're looking at the text, and then at a certain moment it kind of um, becomes no longer legible, something that you see rather than read. And so that's the difference in spatially between seeing and reading. And there you can see the, the, the disjunction between text and image, so with this work. And um, it also asks another interesting question, that is whether the gap between text and image is to be seen as a rift, as a break, or whether it uh, should rather be seen as a connection um, and so that's a little bit like the question I was asking in the beginning, are there many arts or is there just one? And I think the answer tends to be somewhere in between, because in this example of the work by Heiner Stunz, there isn't a complete separation between the genres. It's impossible, because there's always a kind of ambiguity, and 
we have separation, which is the legible part and the illegible part, but we also have complementarity, which means that there's also a porosity and a connectedness. And then, in addition to, to this kind of work, we can also talk about, in other works, about parallelism or isomorphism, which is um, a similarity of processes or structures that come from um, imitation or from independent development as well. And this kind of interchangeability or isomorphism can occur with different media being juxtaposed in space or following each other in time, as we saw in the examples of Nadia and Henri Salah. And um, so I think that these were all works that deal, uh, the, the ones that I've mentioned, these are all works that deal explicitly with the boundaries between sound and visuals, even if, as we saw, they can't always maintain these boundaries. And now I'm going to move on to just a couple of examples of works that try to, to efface these boundaries, to get rid of them. And as we'll see, this doesn't really completely work either, because there's still a distinction. I mean, there's still the distinction between sound and vision. But it's interesting to look at them anyway. Um, so let's see, for instance, there's an exhibition called Lao Kun II, held in Vienna as well in 2010. And um, it took as its starting point the fact that Lessing, who I, who I mentioned earlier on, um, also got to a, po a certain point in his writing where he admitted that poetry and painting do actually exist both in time and in space, even if poetry only indirectly refers to space and painting can only indirectly refer to time. But still, they can do it. They can do it. And the show, and I'm going to show you what that means, because the show actually, the exhibition, tried to capture these moments when, when the borders between image and language, between text and sign and narration and process are violated, and when the image and sign are read and seen at the same time, or when narration and process interfere with each other. And so, so I've got, there are a couple of examples here. Um, for instance, Julien Bismuth, um, whose work, Like a Metaphor, 2009. Now, this was a headphone piece where you had a voice reciting a list of metaphors, such as a work like a hyphen, a work like a break in one's voice. So, you know, things that, sentences that make you try and visualize what's being said while you're hearing it. And um, there's also, for instance, a video by Falca Pisano, a sculpture turning into a conversation. 2006, which consisted of a narrative loosely based around a sculpture and where there were partial views of the sculpture that would flash onto the screen. And here, the listener kind of fills in the gaps between the sound and the visuals and creates a kind of composite mental sculpture that intertwines the two media. And even though each of them remains distinct. That's always uh, what we come back to, in fact. <clears throat> and a uh, last example, um, which is also based on simultaneity of sonic and visual input, is Bernhard Leitner's Pulsating Silence, 2007, which uses sound as a kind of building material, so to speak. Um, so here you've got a panel with loudspeakers attached to the outer sides of these two, sorry, two panels, um, of the two parallel steel panels, which create a kind of soft humming sound that begins and ends abruptly when the listener enters or exits the space between the panels. And here you have sonic as well as physical limits that mark the transition from inside to outside showing that even though sound is most often associated with immateriality and vision with materiality, this border can be overstepped. And sound, uh, in another uh, example here, also takes on a uh, material aspect. Now, this is a, a work by Edwin van der Heide called Pneumatic Sound Fields, 2006, and it's a metallic grid on which you've got valves that emit compressed air, and that creates a kind of, um, a kind of space above um, people's heads, a kind of, almost like a ceiling, in fact. 
um, above the head. And when you've got it, when it's installed outdoors, it's often installed outdoors on on a in a field of grass. So you've got the the field of grass below your feet and the sound field above your head. So that's the idea behind it. But then, of course, once again, we have sound and visuals that are distinct, even though they're very, very close together, but still distinct. And then finally, I, I just want to have a, a short thing about um, works, just looking at how I am for time, I think I'm okay. So like uh, Jackie Irvin's If the Ground Should Open, which is built on a simultaneity of sound and image working together towards the same end. And um, works like that are, in a way, comparable to a Gesamtkunstwerk, or synthesis of the arts, because in the same way as a total work of art, film comprises music, script writing, uh, directing and acting, and these individual arts all serve a common goal. But then, of course, um, we should really call contemporary video art a postmodernist uh, kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, as David Roberts does, because it doesn't have this totalizing meta narrative of um, Wagner's uh, Gesamtkunstwerk, and it, do it doesn't seek to draw parallels between the different arts or posit any kind of fictional unity. So, um, to answer the question with which I began, um, I would say that the arts are neither dependent, neither independent nor unified, but they work together. As in, for instance, John Cage's collaborations with, uh, the, collab with the choreographer Merce Cunningham, where the music is independent of the dancers' movements, but nonetheless takes place at the same time. And for uh, Jean-Louis Jean Deot, uh, a theorist, for instance, the coexistence of the arts is essential to their functioning. For example, the notion of space can be more readily understood and analysed in re reference to time, while poetry continually brushes up against and transforms itself in contact with the other arts, even though it is irreducible to them. Artists and curators contribute to this constant movement on the edges of the genres, asking, as Rainer Bellenbaum and Sabet Buch Buchmann do, to what extent, so I quote, to what extent can picture texts or text pictures be understood as models for a redistribution between the visible and the sayable? How does the field of tension between reading and looking sharpen, shift, or overcome the logic of representative coding, which understands the picture as a window on the world and the text as an act of chronologizing and spatializing. Thank you. So, uh, can, can everybody hear? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so, so maybe we'll just start with the first question, which is, um, because I, I'm sure a lot of you have seen Ghost Rap, but perhaps you saw it in two parts, as it were, you know, the, the photographs upstairs on the ground floor and then the, um, you know, the, the text downstairs. And so perhaps we could ask Nadia if she could join them together for us, as it were. Of course. Um, so a uh, ghost shop is uh, actually, uh, first of all, a collection of uh, testimonies. So it's a collection of... Um, uh, Words uh, uh, which I uh, retranscribe <clears throat> once I ask someone who I, who I met in completely different occasions <clears throat> during my travels um, very often, what are you scared of? And so this testimony uh, to this question is uh, then um, written down, uh, keeping the um, particularity of the speakers, so uh, the melody of the voice. I try to keep in a way uh, what is um, um, around around the language is still uh, still um, audible. So um, the rhythm and the uh, and uh, the onomatopoeias and the, um, so that's why you have the lines in the text, right? That divide up the phrases. Well, I don't want ah. to punctuate it, so I don't want yeah. to have a punctuation. So um, 
so I want to keep it um, keep it uh, keep it in a rhythm which uh, reminds uh, oral language, and uh, then I. Uh, theatralize it in a way because I put it uh, under lights, it's going on, it's going out and uh, by this shift I, I want to give it uh, uh, the status of poetry in a way because mm. to, uh, to, uh, um, it's spoken everyday language but, uh, uh, but it has a quality which might not uh, come out um, uh, like it's not obvious and necessarily. So. I like to put these um, these collections of words um, like into text in this way, yeah. And that's the starting point of the works. And then you and then the photographs. So it starts with the text, with the interviews, and then yeah. you put the interviews into text, and then and then afterwards there's the photographs, right, mm -hmm. where you take pictures of the places that could be imagined to go with the text, right. Very loosely, yes. Uh, so it's actually that's the how I uh, proceed. So I have uh, the texts, and uh, and it's actually the voice of the speakers. Um, I actually carry them around with me then because I have um, well, I collect them, and so I have these um, images which come up with uh, with these um, texts, uh, and uh, and so sometimes um, I'm trying not for all of them. Some of them have a, <clears throat> have a visual counterpart. Uh, where I try to find uh, uh, something which... Um, what would which be like an example of one that has a visual counterpart? Mm -hmm. You mean like a place, a specific place? or? For example, yeah, so uh, could be um, a billion of ants. So the mm. story is about um, someone who uh, has a memory of ants invading uh, yeah. her body uh, at the house and uh, when she's washing the dishes then um, the ants are getting everywhere, and when she's going out of the house, um, because, because, because the dishes are, um, are, um, are um, washed out of, uh, next and uh, like outside, and then all these ants are, are invading like uh, the clothes. And so, um, when I was um, once um, in, um, in Thailand, uh, there was this house uh, which was not abandoned, but it was um, isolated and. Uh, uh, and this story um, came into my mind, so I thought this is maybe a place where I could make this photograph. And um, <clears throat> what might be important to say about these photographs is uh, that they are night photographs, and uh, and in this way they are not really um, like I don't really control them in a, like a like a photographer might put might, might make a setup. Uh, but actually, what I'm doing is. I go to these places and then I wait quite a long time. So it's um, it's and and I don't see too much because it's dark. So <clears throat> it's um, I'm more guided by the sounds surrounding me and uh, by the time staying there. And then I mm. then I uh, then make these photographs. And so um, sometimes I have photographs where you don't see too much <clears throat> because of this procedure. So it's um, it's actually it stays in a way in an auditory like in a um, oral space. So. Um, and then other ones would just be, would be not so much something that would go with it, but just something you imagine, I suppose. Other well, right? it's always something. It's always something I you imagine, set, but it's very it can subjective. be more or less, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, I guess the the pictures they're coming always after mm -hmm. the the text, and they're kind of a, maybe mm -hmm. renders these like for me it's kind of like they always sound very universal. These uh, these yeah. um, these fears. So. Yeah. So I try to archive them in a way this way, you know. But then, of course, it's me choosing uh, yeah. the site, so it's always uh, very subjective. Then. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course, of course. And then, and then afterwards, there's the sound part because, of course, it's three parts, right? So mm -hmm. the sound part, which we're going to hear later on, mm -hmm. but you could also ha envisage eventually having, for instance, um, headphones so that people look at the photos can listen to the sound at the same time. There, yeah. could, there could be that, or mm -hmm. there could be a speaker in the room with a sound that could, while people are looking at the photographs, which would, <coughs> of course, have a, give a very different opinion, a very different um, view of the photographs, which would then be less, uh, you know, autonomous works. So, so there are actually quite a lot of different ways of presenting this mm -hmm. piece, right? 
So there are, there are different, uh, yeah, there, there are um, different states of this work. So which is, I think, something I quite um, do often. Yeah, I touch too. Yeah. So it's uh, so um, <coughs> this it, it exists actually uh, as a sound piece as well. But uh, so as a as a pre as a as a musical piece too. You know. So. Uh, so as a record, and then yes. of course the the, the connection of uh, of uh, of the images to the sound is uh, is something which uh, happens sometimes and sometimes not. Right. So, uh, right. Which is also quite subjective, right? I mean, to of course. some extent. Yeah. Um, well, the, yeah. the, the the texts are uh, are are actually as they are. The descriptions and uh, and. Uh, and the images are then um, an interpretation of them. Mm -hmm. okay. and, um, I, I think it would also be actually really interesting if we could talk a little bit about your, let's say, your influences, your inspiration, you know, how you came to using these kind of three-tiered works, because quite a few of your, your work, perhaps we're going to talk about some of them afterwards, but some of the other examples, but quite a few of them are actually seem to be structured, you know, sound, Text, photography. So, so mm -hmm. could you tell us how you sort of arrived at that? Um, or, you know, rather than just working in one media, having mm -hmm. these three very interdependent. Mm -hmm. ones. Well, it's um, the starting point, I guess, is always the voice, and uh, so uh, I think it's something I'm very attached to. Or it's uh, it's because of of language, of something. Language is um, is um, carried by the voice, but it's uh, the voice is giving more than the language. So there's uh, there's another energy to the voice, which is giving another sense to the words, and uh, this has to do with the um, like when you're in a multilingual context, and if you don't understand the language, then you often interpret the voice in a way so you understand uh, what you hear, but even though you yes. don't understand, so. Yeah. And, and I think this is something uh, which might be related then to some kind of uh, synesthesia when you're um, when you're then connecting uh, actually images to that, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, which would be more the case for my paintings. Uh, yeah. And and so this is uh, the, the 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 beginning of these different media uh, is actually always the voice, and then it's. Uh, and then I'm trying to visualize the voice in a way <coughs> or another. Yes, I see. Mm. I see. Either by a photograph or by a text, in fact. So um, there can be two ways of visualizing it. Or by voice. painting, too. Or by painting. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Okay. And which, and which, and so would it depend on on the voice, you know, on the nature of what's being said, which medium you would choose or, or do you go through different phases that you prefer a particular medium? Um, it's a, a, about the, so it's the series who, who actually, when I start with them, I, I will stick to some kind of um, methodology. So for the, for the Ghost Trap uh, series, I actually um, I painted on the photographs partly as well, first, which are, I don't show them here, but it's actually something which can happen. So. Uh, but it's not necessarily the voice which is giving the picture. It's really the story uh, in this uh, in this context. And uh, but it, uh, what I wanted to say is about the three different parts. So there is um, there is always the collection of words and voices which are related to um, uh, to different sources. It can be interviews, but it can be letters. It can be um, actually texts uh, um, which have been read. And uh, and then there can be as well uh, um, and, so, and and it can be la two languages which I don't quite understand so uh, which has uh, I guess an autobiographical context so mm -hmm. that I uh, like let's say Hungarian or Czech yeah. and whereas these were all languages in your family environment yeah yeah and so so <coughs> this is uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so so this or uh, you know how 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 these how these uh, words can then relate to images. Even though I don't understand them, uh, or even very only in a very specific way, so yeah. this was for pictures of nothing. This was a way um, how I was um, uh -huh. uh, working with that, and so and then they become actually drawings. So I took actually these words. I would I would listen to them, and I would actually make drawings out of these rhythms, uh -huh. 
and out of these rhythm, rhythmic drawings, uh, uh -huh. paintings are actually uh, made. You know, so yeah. so this is actually it's actually always a yeah. transformation from a state to another. And uh -huh. what uh -huh. I find really interesting in the in this uh, in this um, in this process is yes. also what you lose or what you gain. So um, yeah. things are happening. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and they only can happen when you experiment them. So it's a very empirical mm. process. Okay. Mm. So it's because sure. of doing things up here, this form yeah. up here. So, yeah. so that's yeah. why I like to switch yeah. from one um, from one mm. medium to another. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I also um, I also thought it's earlier on you were telling me about a work called uh, Je um, Je serai franc. Right? Ah, which means I will be frank, and which I thought was actually very interesting. And I was wondering how it fits into this actually, because uh, from what you told me, it was um, interviews with bus drivers, mm -hmm. people, sort of any yes. more or less. Bus drivers, I would go up, I let, this yeah. was for the vinyl in Rennes, and I was would, actually would take the bus all the time, and I would speak to the drivers. <coughs> okay. So I would ask them to tell me about their life, you know, what, and uh, so I collected these, um, these testimonies and, uh, and then I, uh, I um, put them in the future tense. So the future tense then brought another dimension to that yeah. because it was um, giving, uh, um, um, uh, uh, how you say, um, premonition, premonition. premonition. Uh, to, to the text, so actually the title of the text was um, is, uh, My name is Frank in English and then it would be like uh, I, my, na my, name, um, <clears throat> um, my name will be Frank, I will be 42 years old, I will have two kids, I will live in the, in the suburbs of, uh, of Rennes I will, so, so, and, so, and so these texts, uh, these interviews in the future tense then suddenly become, um, become a, um, like a fiction which... Uh, oh, Destiny or something very, very, sort of very strange. Yeah, because it it sounds very close to what um, it, um, you yeah. could um, live. Uh, like yeah. it sounds, it's it's a it's a like a, let's say what we call normal life, but put in the future. So sure. uh, it has this sure. Um, sure. suddenly this um, yes. view on on, yeah. on our society from 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 another yeah. point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that's very really interesting. And, um, and also, I thought um, another thing, perhaps we'll talk about, perhaps we'll finish on this question, which is about um, objectivist post poetry, which perhaps um, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it's a kind of poetic genre, I suppose, in a way, although it doesn't really want to be a genre, but it's um, this kind of use of, of texts. Um, for instance, there was, um, we could talk about Charles Resnikoff, who Used, um, who took the transcripts of court cases relating to violent crimes and republished them. He sort of took the, took the text and then more or less um, reproduced them verbatim in, in a book. Only, the only change that he made was mostly was um, to put them, to, to sort of rearrange them like verse so it looked like poetry. And then you would read these really incredible hair-raising stories and and it really called attention to what was being said actually in a really very very strange kind of way and and in fact all the other people who kind of you know followed on from him or were, were working at the same time because this was really quite a, and still is actually quite a big movement especially in the states they were also taking texts from just about anywhere could be anything, in fact, and then reappropriating them and then putting them in another kind of context. So, in a way, a lot of what you're doing is very related to that, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think this was a major influence um, when I discovered through the French, uh, the French uh, poetic, uh, like a specific, uh, um, specific um, poetry scene, uh, which is uh, very much um, influenced by. Uh, Objectivist um, movement, and so um, when I discovered uh, the Revue uh, Liter Literature Générale, which was um, which was published by Pierre Fanny and Olivier Cadieux, mm. uh, this was the first. Uh, this was 1995 or 96. I discovered it a little bit later, 
I was very uh, excited about it. <coughs> so it's the object as well, because um, oral language and the way, I mean, it was very, it had very heteroclit um, review, so there were a lot of different people taking part, and uh, artists as well, like uh, a description of works as well, but a lot of uh, these things were uh, also put into page in a way that you really um, uh, look at it, you know, and uh, it, it gave me an approach to language which uh, seemed quite um, Right, it sounded right. You know, it gives it gives it a complexity, and it, it actually sure. gives it um, gives the complexity to, to to voice and to speech, and does not um, uh, compress it in, in a normal normalized way. You know, and so uh, so Charles Resnikov with his testimonies um, and as well his, his last piece um, like Holocaust, I think is um, is trying to uh, to. To give justice to a um, to 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 a speech to testimonies uh, in in, a, in the right way, so not to, without mannerism and uh, trying to to give a voice to to these um, to these um, testimonies and uh, and uh, yeah, how to say um, yeah, how to say yeah, something which you can't really uh, describe differently, you know. So uh, this is something for Charles Res Resnikov, which was important for me. And then there's someone else in this, like in the, in the original movement, who is William Carlos Williams, who did um, this um, poems where he describes the Bruegel uh, paintings in, very, in a very simple English language, like American actually. So he, uh, and so this is uh, another uh, like important actually uh, input because uh, for me this was really something that worked very well how he described simply as poems what he sees you know mm. and so there's a, there's a you know uh, yeah. Um, yeah. and and uh, yeah the, the yeah the Resnikov text then had uh, and Sukowski text they had a lot of um, you know um, echoes in the French poetry scene you know with um, Anne Marie Albiac and. Uh, yeah. Uh, with um, Katy Molnar, for example, a Hungarian um, poet who lives in, in France and who is actually, um, she's um, writing how she hears the French language, which uh, then becomes, uh, uh, of course, very different to, 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 to what uh, we know from French grammar. Mm -hmm. And then she's uh, performing these texts as well. And, uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, yes. so, for instance, when you're transcribing these interviews, say with the bus driver, mm -hmm. it's, it's actually very similar in some ways. It? It's, yeah, I, I, not with the shift to the future tense, but no, definitely yeah. with, the, with the fact that yeah. to um, maybe to, um, to try to capture something uh, which is actually quite poetic already um, as it is, and then yeah. to yeah. kind of um, yeah. give it, um, like to give it a form. And in this case, yes. it was actually a, a booklet uh, which was given out for free in the dino, so there were 5,000 exemplaries, and it was starting at, uh, at page uh, 71. So, uh, so actually, uh, you thought you have only a part of it, but this was actually um, the idea. So, it, you know, it could continue, of course. Oh. Mm. Um, anyway, um, I think perhaps uh, perhaps we should move on to the performance. Uh, so, thank you very much, Nadia. Mm -hmm. Thank you.